Today we're going to look at Romans chapter 8, and in particular, for those whom he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. This is an amazing thing that God has done for us. So I want to take us on a little uh, walk, I suppose. Brace yourself, Tim and, Mike, uh, Tim and Johnny. Up a mountain. We're going to climb some mountains. Okay. So these guys know what that can mean. The book of Romans, is, is, it stands alone in the Bible as the doctrine of Christianity that covers just about everything but is majestic in its presentation. And then when we get to chapter 8, it's like Mount Everest among all the other majestic peaks. But first I'd like to read to you something from a politician. So about 15 years ago, my oldest son came home from school saying, the new local member came to school and, and shared part of his speech with us, and he's a Christian. I thought, that's interesting. Let's see what he's got to say. And, and I love this. I've quoted this many times because uh, he was a really good member for the time he was there. He's retired now. But he was a Hong Kong Chinese born man. And I'll just read from his inaugural speech, just a few lines here. I came to Australia, to Sydney, in 1976 at the age of 17, shortly after the government abolished the discriminative white Australia policy. My father enrolled me in a local state school. It was a beautiful school with clean classrooms and stunning playing fields. It was also far better than the school I had attended in Hong Kong, where my father had to take a second job to pay for my school fees. However, I refused to go to that school because I thought it would be very expensive and I knew that we could not afford it until my father told me that the school was free. Not long after, I was injured in a football game and possibly in need of hospital care. Again, I refused to go to the hospital because I thought it would be expensive. Again, my father told me that the hospital also was free. I found myself asking the question, what kind of country is this? What kind of country is this that education is free and medical care is also free? You know, we live in a great country. I love Australia. I've been to a lot of other countries. This is the place that I would choose over every other place. And there's a lot of other great benefits of being part of this country. A lot of freedoms we enjoy. We live a great lifestyle. But do you know what? We're not here to talk about Australia. We're here to talk about a kingdom that God has brought us into. And as we have a look at what this kingdom is, there's no better place to go than Romans chapter 8. Because if we're going to look at how we're going to be conformed to the image of his son, we better see what God has done for us and what it is that he's requiring of us, and what it is, what sort of kingdom we're going into. So, Philippians 3, you don't need to turn there, but I would like you to turn to Romans chapter 8, because we're going to walk through there. Philippians 3, 20 and 21 says, Our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly bodies to be like his glorious body, by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. You have to ask, what kind of kingdom is this? Let's have a little look. Let's go wandering down Romans chapter 8, or wandering up, climbing the hills and the mountains and the peaks that are there. Romans chapter 8 starts off after chapter 7, where, where this situation has been presented of, of sin and the difficulties of, of how do we deal with sin. But the beginning of Romans chapter 8 is, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Do you know what? How amazing is that, that we can actually have something told to us that not only are we innocent, but there is no grounds for finding us guilty before, not the highest courts of this land, before the throne of God in his judgment. In the judgment of God, those of us who are born again have no grounds for being found guilty of anything. You know, I really could stop the sermon there and say, look, just go, believe and obey. And that's it. You know, I can sit down now. I'd be happy. But, but I've prepared a lot more than that. But that really in itself, if you got nowhere further than that when you were praying one day, wow. But then verse 2 says, For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. So, so we have a freedom from that law of sin and death that is on every person on earth. Everyone stands guilty under it, but we've been given a new law. Much like in Esther's day, they came up with another law to say, go and defend yourselves against that happening that the law is going to bring upon you. God has not only defended us, but he's elevated us over that law. 
Do you know how much trouble, how much work, how much money people spend in the courts of Australia, in the courts of the world, to try and get out of what they're accused of? Innocent or guilty people. Everyone is doing their very best to be able to get out of it and to be found free and innocent. But we've been given another law. God's given it to us. We're not guilty. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending his son in the likeness of sinful flesh and then for sin, or an alternate reading is, as an offering for sin or a sacrifice for sin, he condemns sin in the flesh. That's pretty amazing that God has sent his own son as the offering for our sin. We hear that and the gospel is based upon that, that Jesus Christ died for sinners according to the scriptures. That is amazing. If you do not know that, if you do not believe that here today, I pray that you take that to your heart and that you fall on your knees in repentance before God and say, I am sorry that Jesus had to pay the price of my sin, but I thank you because I couldn't, because none of us could. And that perfect offering for sin was made for us. And then we go on in verse 4. In order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Matthew Henry in his commentary says, both in our justification and our sanctification, the righteousness of the law is fulfilled. I don't know about you, I've been a Christian half my life, so there was a lot of my life where I wasn't even trying to please God. But to think that as I walk, I am walking in the righteousness of the law, if you, if you think about it without being saved, if you think about it without God's Holy Spirit in you, it's mission impossible. You cannot do it. But God has made it that we can do it. And these things that we're looking at, we're looking at to see what God has done so that we can be conformed to the image of his son. So far, really, nothing's been required of us. Verse 5, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. So, so we have a new way. We are walking and living in the Spirit. We're not walking the old way, living according to the lusts of our heart, living according to the dictates of our mind, living according to, to what we think is the right way to go. We have the Spirit to lead us to walk that way. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Do you know what? We're not in that category. If we're born again, if we're regenerated by the Spirit of God, we are not in the category that's hostile to God. Our mind is not at enmity with our God. For the, I'm going to read that again. For the mind, for to set the mind on the flesh is death. Oh, I jumped the verse, that's why. I'll go back to verse 6. For the mind that is, uh, I'll start again. For to set the mind on the flesh is death. But to put the mind on the spirit is life and peace. So we've been given life and peace. And not just life for the term of our natural life here, but we're talking about eternal life and peace. People strive for peace all over the world in so many different ways, yet we have been given it. And I've done verse 7. When we're not hostile to God, we are at peace with him. Verse 8, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Well, then the opposite is the case. If you're in the Spirit, you please God. So we're not in a situation where we're not pleasing God. And sometimes I know how it works. Our mind makes us think because we've slipped up, we haven't been as good as we could have because we've actually sinned. We go, oh, I'm not pleasing to God. We are pleasing to God. And part of being a Christian is understanding that we have to overcome that sin and remember that we're pleasing to God. Look, those of us who've got children know that. Even when our children do the wrong thing, we still love them. They're still pleasing to us because they are beautiful. They are our child. They are our children. Verse 9 goes on, You, however, are not in the flesh but in the Spirit, if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you. So that's telling us, the people to whom this letter was written were Christians, that the Spirit of God dwells in you. It isn't your own spirit and your own thoughts that you're leading, that you're following. It isn't your own... Uh, imagination or your own best effort but it's the Spirit of God who dwells in us 
But then it goes on to say, anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. That's a fearful thing. And the Bible does tell us to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. If you find yourself wondering if maybe you don't belong to Christ, seek the Lord, pray, ask him to reveal it to you, to give you that assurance that God so freely gives. And then verse 10 goes on. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. You know what, we're not just dealing with, you know, it might be nice to, to do some interesting things, you know, go on a picnic, go watch a movie or something. We're talking about righteousness of God in our life. Where are you going to go to find such lofty ideals, such high and great claims on your life as the Word of God, as our living God? The songs we sang today were just amazing. I was just, just really rejoicing. Thank you, Patrick. He always plays my favourite songs. Just that they, they brought out so much of what I want to cover here today. So much of how we should come before our God in love, in awe. You know, we've seen God's glory. You can't unsee it. No one who's seen, even those who reject the gospel, no one who's seen the glory of God can ever imagine that he hasn't. But those of us who have and who have taken that to ourselves uh, in faith, wow, we can just go on from glory to glory, being transformed into the image of Christ. Verse 11, If the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. So we have life here and we have eternal life in this body. And you have to wonder, I don't know about you, but many times I've wondered, how is it that our body didn't shatter into a trillion bits when the spirit of God, the holy God of heaven, came to dwell inside this body of sin? How is it that we can stand at all or breathe one more breath? But God is so kind. He is so gracious. He is so merciful. He is such a good God. Where can you go to find a God like this? You can't go anywhere else. You could come here. You can't find him anywhere else. So then, brothers, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. So our ongoing transformation, our ongoing conformity to Christ is through the Spirit. It's not our own strength. Your own strength won't get you far. We have an overcoming power that leads us on into eternal life and glory. Verse 14, for all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. Hallelujah. You'd have to go, that's one of the mountain peaks, isn't it? If you're led by the Spirit of God, you've been declared to be a son of God. Wow. You know, sometimes there's a little temptation when you see people who are very successful maybe really rich, living the great life, and you go, oh, for a moment, only for a moment, then you have to consider, would you swap what you have now to be richer than the richest man on earth? No, what for? What are you going to get with it? You can't buy these things with money. Your lifestyle or fame can't do them. Who wants to be famous and on TV? Our name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life. You can't get more famous than that. You know, J.I. Packer, if you haven't read the book, Knowing God, it is a really beautiful read. It's a nice, easy read. You can get it as an audio book. It is really good. But he nails all of Christianity summed up as adoption through propitiation. And, and he says, if he were to get the focus of the New Testament in three words, that would be it. And he said, but I do not expect ever to meet a richer or more pregnant summary of the gospel than that. And, and so we've been adopted into God's family through this propitiation. So God's anger at sin was appeased. It was placated. It was put down because of Jesus' sacrifice. But then God's favour has been bestowed on his children whom he's adopted through Christ's righteousness being given to us. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. So we've been released from fear. And I know fears come to us, but we haven't been given the spirit of, the spirit of fear, tells us in Timothy. 
but of love, of power and of a sound mind. And when we find ourselves not in love and of power and a sound mind, guess what? We have the scripture to come back to and go, the scripture tells me I have this. Lord, I seek you for this. Lord, I need more, more of your love in my life, more of your power, more of your sound mind. It is there for us as sons. If your child comes to you and he's hungry, you don't say, come back later. Say, what do you want to eat? The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. So it isn't just we decide, yeah, yeah, I'm a child of God. It isn't like that. The Spirit works with us, confirming it. And if children, this is where it gets just almost too much to take in, then heirs, heirs of God, that's a really great thing, but co-heirs with Christ. When we think of the one character in all of history who stands alone, there is no one even up to his knees. It's Jesus Christ, the man Jesus Christ, the God-man Jesus Christ. And what he is inheriting is all of the kingdom of God. And we are co-heirs with him. Some days we don't live like that because some days we don't see it because some days are just days where our head is not in the clouds looking out from the mountains because life gets to us. But imagine in your prayer if you go, you know what, I'm going to pray about that. And just start thinking through what is actually entailed, what is, what is in that will that says, well, all the heirs of God are going to get this, all the co-heirs of Christ are going to inherit these things. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us, the ESV says, but a lot of other translations say in us. Glory is going to be revealed to us because we will see Christ face to face. What an amazing day. That will be a day. There will be a day when some of us here may well be alive that morning. And by the end of that day, we're going to be seeing Christ face to face in glory. But we also are going to be revealed with glory. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. We will be revealed. We are walking around shrouded. People don't know who we are. Some do, sure. But it's not yet revealed what we shall be. But the scripture tells us when we see him, we will be like him. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself would be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. We go first. The creation doesn't get fixed up and then us. We get glorified, then the creation follows in. So as Christ ushers in and we follow in his glory, then the creation follows our glory. You know what? We're the crowning glory of God's creation. Not the other way around. For we know the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. Not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we eagerly wait for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. These bodies are going to be redeemed. They're going to be traded in. They're going to be upgraded to an eternal model. That's a pretty exciting thing for those of us who've had a bit of sickness lately or who know sickness long term or who have any failings in our body. We're going to have a body that has no sickness, no failings, no weaknesses. So we enjoy the first fruits of the Spirit. Galatians 5 verses 22 and 23 say that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. We should be seeing those things growing in our life as the Holy Spirit purifies us, as we are more and more sanctified before our God. If you're not seeing those things, get on your knees. Seek the Lord. The Holy Spirit is God's seal and guarantee of these things, of the future life. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what he sees? So we've got hope 
Not just hope that we might win the lottery. That's just a fanciful imagination. And you know what? Most people don't even do better out of it. They end up worse. Right? We've got something so much better than the world is offering. We have a hope of an eternity in Christ's presence. We have some knowledge now, but we will be growing in our knowledge and appreciation of who God is and of his greatness. Imagine that. We can study all our lives here and we're only going to get a little tiny glimpse of the character and nature of our eternal God, of our infinite God. If he is infinite, we can never get to the end of knowing and understanding and loving him better and enjoying him more. That is a glorious thought. But if we hope for what we see, no, but if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Isn't patience a good thing? Don't we all need more patience? You know what? The Spirit gives us patience. It is part of the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And we wait with patience. Because I know, if you're anything like me, there are days where you think, oh, if only I could just be with the Lord. Then I wouldn't have any problems. But that's not what we're called to do. No shortcuts. God will give you the shortcut if he wants to. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. Uh, this is just amazing. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought. We don't even know how to pray properly or what for. But the Spirit intercedes for us with groanings too deep for uttering, too deep for words. If we don't even know how to pray for what we should pray for, how are we going to work out everything else? We have to just surrender. If we don't surrender to Christ, if we don't surrender to our great God, we've got nothing. We're lost. We'll be tossed to and fro. But if we let the Spirit lead and intercede for us, how great and how mighty. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for us, for the saints, the set-apart ones of God, according to the will of God. So the Holy Spirit isn't interceding for us in whatever manner he desires, but according to the will of God. We're not going to get a better prayer than the one the Holy Spirit leads us to pray. This is another pinnacle. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. Do you know what? We won't always understand everything that happens to us. And the bad things that happen to us, they still hurt us the way they hurt people in the world. But we have a consolation that we can fall back on. This is all working for good, one way or another. And we don't need to understand some things in this life because we know we will get to get the full revelation of them. So if we hold out in hope, patiently trusting our God, believing, such an important word, believing what the Bible says. You know what? Let God be true and every man a liar. If it says it in here, we better believe this first and say, my thinking can't be right because I don't get it. Oh, here we are. For those whom he foreknew, he foreknew us. Before the world was even made, he knew each of us. That's just amazing, isn't it? And I know, expecting our first grandchild, we're trying to, we've seen little images in the, in the ultrasounds and they say, what's he going to be like? He looks like this, but what sort of boy is he going to be? You try, but God knew it all. Those whom he foreknew, he also predestined, he predestined his children to be conformed to the image of his son. And not just for our good, but we get the first fruits of that. We enjoy it first. That he might be the firstborn among many brothers. That he might be the preeminent among many brothers. And he is always going to be preeminent. You know what, if you play in a team of any sort or you work in a certain workplace, you might think, you know what, I do a better job than that person. I'm, I'm a little bit faster or I can pass the ball better than that person or I can do a drop shot better. There's nothing we're going to be better than Jesus in. So we don't have to be striving. We know he is preeminent and that's what we want our life to do is glorify his preeminence so that we, as we are more and more conformed to his image, that we bring glory to him in a way that we get joy as well. What a great calling we've been called to. And those whom he's predestined, he's also called. And those whom he's called, he has also justified. And those whom he has justified, he has also glorified. This is talking in past tense for something that's coming. It's a done deal.
You know, like Michael Choi might have said, what sort of country is this? I keep saying, what sort of God is this I serve? What sort of kingdom is this he's bringing us into? I just... It's, words do fail us. That's why the scripture says, you know, with groanings too deep for words. What then shall we say to these things if God is for us? Who can be against us? God's for us. If you were in court and you had the best barrister in the land, you'd be going, you know what, I've got a pretty good hope in this. And you know what? We've got the best advocate in the land. We've got the judge on our side already. It's a done deal. He did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Well, it's already given. God's decided he's going to graciously give us all things. That doesn't mean a Lamborghini if that's what you want. All things that pertain to life and godliness. That's what it means. Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It's God who justifies. Let them say what they like. The early Christians were renowned because of their victory with which they went to death with. People couldn't believe it. These guys, well these guys, sorry, our brothers and sisters in the Lord were going off to their death victorious. Not in fear and trembling, although they probably had fear in their bodies, but they went there knowing that they were going to be with the Lord, knowing they had overcome in this life. I don't know about you, but I've decided... If I'm faced with people who want to kill me, I'm going to share the gospel with them. I'm going to go out in victory as well. Who else would like to do that? I think you have to make that decision before the time comes. If you wait till the time, you might just temporarily forget and go, uh, uh, let's not do that. Let's be so ready for the day when we are faced with our death that we are just glorifying God all the way and going out in victory like our brothers and sisters did so many years ago. It is God who justifies. No one can bring a charge against us that has any value. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who rose from the dead, who is seated at the right hand of God. Now this, this one, if you haven't gone to a mountain peak, this one does it. Who is also interceding for us. So not only is the Holy Spirit interceding for us, but the second person of the Godhead as well is interceding for us. Whew. Who shall separate us from the love of God? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation? The answer obviously here is no. Shall distress? No. Persecution? No. Famine? No. Nakedness? No. Danger? No. Sword? No. There's nothing. Nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. So, we're more than conquerors. I don't know how you can be more than a conqueror. If you overcome everyone in the whole country, you're the conqueror. It's yours. But we're more than conquerors because we've been given a crown to be seated with Christ. So, we've inherited something so rich, so magnificent, so valuable, so beautiful. And then verses 38 and 39. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. I don't know where in the world you could come to any writings. I am nearly finished. Don't get nervous that I'm turning the page. I just want to make sure I get the last things done. I don't know where in the world you could go to get anything that even comes remotely close to what is given to us there. You know, I, I read a lot of really good literature when I was younger and it's very enjoyable, but I have no need to go back to them because all they offered was a good story. But we're not reading a good story in the Bible. We're reading our life story. We're reading God's life story. God's history revealed to us. You can't get that through creation. You know... One of my life, life verses is 1 John 4, 17. But the part that I remember that is like something that just stands out is, as he is, so are we in this world. What? As he, Jesus, is, so are we in this world. 
we have the aroma of life before God, the aroma of death to those that don't receive the gospel we preach. But we have the ability through loving one another and loving our God to show our God. We still have to share the gospel. Don't think you can do the gospel without words. The gospel has to have words. The creation does not reveal the gospel, reveals the glory of God. So we're left with this great mountain that we've climbed and really not much left before we pray. It's believing and obeying that seal it. If we believe this and we obey the word, then we can climb that mountain every day and get higher every day. There's nothing better. I, I used to like running up hills and mountains in Canberra. There's nothing better than being right up high looking down on everything. You get such a different view of it. But you know, the reality for us is we have to live down there. We can't live up on that mountain yet. The time hasn't come for us to stay at the top of this grand, majestic mountain of life in God's presence and only the righteousness of God's presence. But we have to live among the sinful in the world and we have to go out to this world with the gospel. So I'd like to finish by praying. Uh, if you would join with me, please. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your beautiful word. We thank you, Lord, that you are a great and mighty God, a holy God, a righteous God, an eternal God, an infinite God. Lord, you are a God of great power and wisdom. Yet you are a God who is so gentle and tender with his children who leads them all the way with our Saviour leading us. Lord God, we just thank you and praise you that each of us would come before you for your great work on our life, that we would be conformed to the image of your Son according to the work of your Holy Spirit. Lord, that your word would be in us and alive and coming out of our mouth as we walk around this world, that we would share your love with those around us. Lord, we pray that you would just be with us moment by moment, that we would trust you more, that we would love you more, that we would love our neighbour as ourself, that we would be all that we should be day by day until the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.